Oh, good day. Uh, I'm Laura Hummers, and I'm really happy to be here. Um, I am uh, coming to you today from Baltimore, uh, where I am co-director of the Johns Hopkins Scleroderma Center, and right at the moment, Cicada Central. Um, and I'm also part of the Medical and Scientific Advisory Board for the Foundation. And uh, my topic today is predicting progression in scleroderma. And I wish we were all together in person, uh, but I'm really optimistic about next year. So we'll get started. So our objectives today are to review what we consider to be some of the main complications of scleroderma and discuss the importance of what we call phenotype in scleroderma and ways that we define uh, phenotype. And that word phenotype means kind of recognizable features of the disease. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. But basically I'd like to walk through kind of how we think as physicians who specialize in scleroderma about how we use this information about, you know, what we can recognize about a patient's scleroderma to inform what their risk might be for development of complications. So we're gonna look at this across multiple aspects of scleroderma, including the skin, lung fibrosis, scleroderma kidney disease or renal crisis, pulmonary hypertension, and we'll have probably just a couple minutes at the end to talk about digital ulcers and severe GI disease. And then as we go through, uh, we will talk about how we're gonna screen for each of these uh, amongst our patients, these complications. So this slide is not meant to be read in any detail, uh, but this was a re really nice piece of work that was put together by uh, Janet Pope and her colleagues uh, in Canada that looked at some of the organ complications of scleroderma in a, in a large group of patients. And she called this the rule of 15. Uh, and what that means is that if you take some of the major complications of scleroderma, like who develops progressive pulmonary fibrosis, um, or pulmonary hypertension as examples, it seems to occur in about 15% of patients. Uh, now this obviously isn't uniformly true across every complication of the disease, but um, it's true enough that it's kind of seemed appropriate to call this the rule of 15. But, you know, that's kind of helpful for us as people who investigate this disease. Um, but as a rule, there's really no uniform progression of disease. And we recognize that it's really like subsets of patients that develop these specific complications. So when I'm taking care of a patient, I'm trying to understand what a, my patient's uh, individual path is gonna be uh, and what I should be looking for and where we should be uh, investing treatment um, at the research level it's very helpful for us as a research community to try and understand these group level trajectories uh, because that's really gonna help us design clinical trials for groups of patients who we think of being at high risk and investigate new therapies in specific groups of patients. So I'm gonna start out with a case and I just wanted to quickly pause for a second. I forgot to mention at the beginning of this, uh, we are gonna be able to take questions um, in the sidebar. So uh, please, as we're going along, I'm going to be um, on the um, seminars as being, as being broadcast so we can try to answer some questions in real time. Sorry about that. Um, so I'm going to start with a case. So this patient is a 45 year old woman uh, who was well until 2018 in June, where she developed a new onset of hand stiffness and swelling and subsequently developed nude sensitivity to cold and noticed her fingers started turning colors. Um, and then this changed from kind of some stiffness to abrupt onset of swelling in her hands and feet, and then developed new finger ulcers. And over the next several months, developed progressive tightness in the skin and limited range of motion because of pain in her fingers and across some of her other joints like wrists, elbows, and ankles. She was seen by her primary care physician. There was concern that this was arthritis and carpal tunnel syndrome, which is actually a pretty common scenario at the beginning. Um, sorry, um, and was referred to rheumatology and seen in December of that year. And the differential diagnosis included rheumatoid arthritis, uh, lupus, and scleroderma, uh, but it wasn't clear where, kind of in this spectrum, the patient fit. Again, a pretty common scenario. 
for antibodies, we're really notable for being ANA positive, and this just is a marker of having autoimmunity, and was diagnosed as having connective tissue disease, maybe early scleroderma, and was referred to a scleroderma center. Um, so she uh, is seen in the scleroderma center and was noted to have skin tightness in her fingers, hands, forearms, feet, and lower legs. Uh, with a modified Rodman skin score, which is the way we assess the degree of skin tightness of 18, which is a, a significant burden of tightness in the skin. It was noted that she has issues with her tendons and her wrists and ankles with what we call tendon friction rubs. And when we looked at her blood vessels under a little microscope, the blood vessels were abnormal. And additional laboratory testing suggested she made antibodies to a protein called RNA polymerase 3, which we'll talk about a little bit later. She had normal lung function and echocardiogram and, and CT scan with really minimal amounts of scar tissue. So this is a patient scenario that may sound familiar to some of you, and um, certainly we see uh, this scenario pretty frequently in our scleroderma center. Uh, so the question is, what do I tell this patient about her risk for progressive disease in her skin, in her lung, or other organ involvement? And you know, when do we offer therapy? And if so, what therapy and for which one of these possible problems? So I'm just gonna take a step back and again, try to give you a little insight into terms of how we um, as the treating physicians try to you know, think about scleroderma. And I'm just gonna start by saying that something you probably all know that the scleroderma disease process is complicated um, in terms of how we study it and how we understand it because it's rare. It has pretty wide variation in how it expresses itself. So one patient's scleroderma may look totally different than another patient's scleroderma. It involves multiple different organ systems and multiple different pathologies, meaning there's an immune system or inflammation problem. There's a blood vessel or vascular problem. There's the scarring, fibrosis, connective tissue problem. Uh, so it's, it's complicated to understand. But, you know, centers like ours and other uh, multi-center initiatives uh, in the U.S. and, and abroad uh, have put together large numbers of patients with data that's followed over time, and actually doing this really helps us, if we collect large numbers of patients, reduce some of this complexity because we can look at, you know, specific subsets of the disease. And then the other concept I want to talk about is this concept of phenotype. So phenotype means an observable characteristic. So when we're talking about scleroderma, we're talking about is the skin restricted in distribution to just the fingers or is it more widespread? So what we call limited or diffuse scleroderma. Is it based on a presence of whether an organ is involved or not involved or what antibody somebody makes? And you know, when you can sufficiently do this, you could say, okay, this person has limited skin with no lung or kidney involvement and make this antibody. And then you can take that data, like I said, from these you know, larger data sets and say, okay, if you compare that with how well somebody does or how well they respond to medicines or who's going to be higher risk for complications, then, you know, when we see patients in the office, we can take information, okay, if we have a patient who has this phenotype, um, we can get a sense of, hmm, what do we have to think about? What do we have to worry about? So that's what we're going to try and get to today. Um, so one of the ways we phenotype patients is by the degree of skin involvement. And probably many of you are familiar with this terminology is that we subdivide patients who have scleroderma into two major skin subsets. One is called limited and one is called diffuse. And as you can imagine, the patients with limited scleroderma have a more restricted distribution of skin involvement. And by definition, it's below the elbows and knees, but actually most commonly, it just affects the fingers in patients with limited scleroderma. Whereas patients with diffuse scleroderma have widespread skin involvement. So you'll hear us use this terminology as we go through this presentation uh, for limited and diffuse forms of the disease. And then another way, uh, and probably actually maybe even a more important way that we think about subsets of patients with scleroderma is by the antibody that they make. So uh, some of these names may look familiar to some of you, so scleroderma being an autoimmune disease, that word autoimmune means that a patient is making antibodies against self proteins. And these big fancy words here like topoisomerase 1 and RNA polymerase 3 are um, some of these proteins that patients with scleroderma make antibodies uh, to. 
And if we can find out the antibody that somebody makes, this is one of the more uh, significant features of the disease that tells us something about what problems we might want to look for. So a few examples of this. Patients who make this SCL70 antibody, which is also called topoisomerase 1, just to make things more confusing, uh, very tightly associates with the presence of lung fibrosis. So people who make this antibody more frequently have lung fibrosis. Now, not everybody who makes this antibody has a significant lung fibrosis, but it certainly makes us think a little bit more about it when we know somebody makes this antibody. Another example is this antibody called RNA polymerase 3. This associates with the, some of the most significant uh, forms of diffuse skin involvement where the skin progresses fairly aggressively. And these patients are also at much higher risk for developing scleroderma kidney disease. So as we go through some of these more specific complications, we'll kind of go through uh, some of the things that we consider to be risk factors and you'll hear these antibody names uh, come up uh, as we go through this discussion. So then we can say, okay, when somebody comes into the office, this is kind of how we start to you know, think about uh, an individual patient's disease. Have they had disease for a long time or a short amount of time? Is their skin subtype in this limited group or the diffuse group? Which antibody do they make? And do their baseline tests suggest, you know, there's already a problem in the lung or they've already developed severe Raynaud's. And then ideally we'd, we would have biomarkers that would help us predict. So these would be things like we would measure in the blood, for example, that would also kind of help tell us about somebody's risk for progression. So now go back to the patient that I presented a few minutes ago. And I would say this patient's phenotype is that they have early disease with less than a year of uh, from their symptom onset. They clearly had this diffuse skin subtype. And I told you that they made antibodies to RNA polymerase 3, which is this specific protein. Uh, but their lung function data looked pretty normal and they'd already had some digital ulcers. So that's going to kind of help uh, drive the discussion in terms of, okay, let's think about these things and what we think this individual patient might be facing as we kind of go down the road of their scleroderma together. So what about the skin? Who's at high risk for having progression of skin tightness? This is one of the things that uh, concerns patients the most, and this is certainly an area where there's been a lot of progress in terms of clinical trial development. Uh, this is an area where I would love to have you know, new therapies for patients who are gonna be at risk for progression of skin tightness. So who is this group of patients? Uh, so first of all, we assess how much skin tightness there is by doing what's called the modified Rodman skin score. So this is the physician uh, pinching several areas of the skin across the body to say, you know, how thickened is this skin? Um, and you do this across 17 different body areas and you give it a score of zero, which is normal, to three, which is really so tight you can't make a pinch, uh, and give it a total score. Uh, and again, the subsets of skin involvement are that patients with limited scleroderma tend to have very low modified Raman skin scores, whereas people with diffuse scleroderma have higher skin scores. You know, so what happens to the skin just by itself? Say we didn't do anything in patients who have this diffuse form of the skin disease. And this is really the only group of patients who really need an intervention in terms of trying to prevent progression or treat progression uh, in terms of their skin disease, people who have limited scleroderma, who have skin tightness just in their fingers, probably don't need uh, therapy. So this is what happens to the skin score of patients kind of in the natural history of disease in those who have this diffuse form of skin disease. So this is on the left here. This is a score of zero, meaning no skin tightness at all. And around 50 is about as high as you can be in terms of a skin score. And so people have this diffuse form of the disease when they were first evaluated had, you know, pretty high uh, levels of this modified Rodman skin score. But the natural history is, is that this tends to improve over time, which is great. And this sometimes leads my patients to say, well, great, then don't, you don't need to give me any kind of medicine to treat this. This is just going to get better on its own. The problem is, one, there's a wide degree of variability in, in how somebody's skin will progress. And I can't predict yet here, you know, who's going to have a very hot, continue to have a very high skin score or who's going to improve significantly. 
And more importantly, during this period of time where the skin is tight, and many of you probably recognize this, this tightness in the skin can cause a restriction in motion or something you know, called contractures or damage. It may not be fixed when, even if the skin gets soft. So we think it's really important to try to treat people who either already have a lot of skin involvement or who we think is very high risk for having uh, diffuse skin involvement. So how do we do that? We identify people at risk for early signs of diffuse skin disease. And those patients start out presenting like the case that I described. They have this early swelling and inflammation. It's very common to have patients say, you know, I woke up one day and my hands and feet were swollen. That is a sign that this is kind of an early phase of diffuse skin disease. Again, I told you some of the antibodies that someone makes, particularly that RNA polymerase 3 antibody, is a group of patients who pretty characteristically are going to have diffuse skin involvement. So if you see somebody very early on that still has mild skin symptoms or tightness, but makes that antibody, we're definitely much more likely to offer that patient therapy. If they've had a rapid evolution of their symptoms, they systemically feel well, but unwell. They don't, you know, they lose weight, they feel very fatigued. These may be signs that this is an early stage of the diffuse kind of skin disease. So we monitor the skin very closely in this high risk group and we intervene early in those who either seem to be progressing or have these kind of prominent risk factors for progressing in their skin. And this was a study uh, that was done out of uh, the UK that looked at uh, kind of what happens to the skin over time. Uh, and this study suggested that those patients who have a uh, high skin score at the time their scleroderma was recognized and didn't seem to improve over time. It had disease for a little bit longer. And I think you can uh, extract from this, this study that suggests that the earlier we treat somebody who we think is gonna progress, uh, probably the better. So uh, this set of uh, next couple of slides is data that comes out of our scleroderma center at Johns Hopkins. And this is, um, again, the skin scores on the scale on the left. And on the bottom here is time. So this is uh, what happens to the skin over time. And these patients are clustered together by the behavior of their skin disease over time. So we put people in this cluster who had very low skin score that really never changes over time. And most of our patients who have limited scleroderma fall into this category. But as you can see, there's a pretty wide variety in what happens to the skin over time in different clusters of patients. So it would be really helpful to know, you know what discriminates this cluster of patients who start with a high skin score that doesn't seem to get better over time with this cluster where patients do have a kind of a higher skin score over time, but they do seem to have some degree of improvement. So this is what we do on the research side to really try to, again, understand uh, both at the group level, when you take a group of patients with scleroderma, or at the individual level, you know, what might happen to somebody's skin over time. And now this takes that same kind of data, skin score on the, on the left here, time on the bottom, and says, well, what if you look at people who make a particular antibody? So again, I think this kind of data is really important. So this says, okay, if you make RNA polymerase three, and the more blue, represented in each of these graphs, the more patients there are who make this antibody. So for example, this group over here, most of these patients made RNA polymerase 3 antibodies. And this is a group who started off high and didn't have that much improvement. And we almost never, there's no blue over here, see this kind of skin disease, mild and stays stable in people who have this antibody. And there are some people kind of in these in-between groups. And again, as a researcher, it's really important that we try to understand what discriminates you know, from this group here, from this group here, from this group here. Uh, and antibody is one of the ways that we try to do that. Uh, and then we can layer on information about you know, well, who got exposed to uh, certain drugs you know, during this time, again, to try to understand, you know, are there subgroups of people who may respond to a particular drug or not? Uh, so again, this is things that we do at the research level to try to understand what somebody's skin might do over time and hopefully understand you know who's going to respond to particular types of therapy. 
So to go back to our patient, I would say, again, they had Rolly disease. Again, we talked about their antibody RNA polymerase three. So I would say one, this person just with those features who would be high risk for progression of skin disease. And they already actually had a significant amount of skin disease. So they should receive treatment directed at improving their skin disease progression and should be a candidate for new trials of new therapy as well. So this is a group of patients uh, who we often uh, consider as good candidates for clinical trials to study new medications that might help this uh, progression of skin disease. So it's actually true that the majority of patients who have scleroderma will not need intervention to prevent skin progression. About two thirds of our patients fall into that limited subset of disease. Most of those patients don't need and probably will not need uh, treatment directed at their skin. The overall tendency is for improvement in most patients, even who have diffuse disease, but there are factors that are present at the beginning that may tell us a lot about how the skin may change over time. How long they've had scleroderma, uh, what antibody they make, when were the medicines started. Now, if we had a drug that was a, what we call a home run, you know, we wouldn't have to think so much about these factors because we would take anybody at risk and if we could turn off the disease just like that, uh, that would be great. So far, the therapy we have um, doesn't do that. And, uh, but we do think there are medicines that are probably effective. But again, we have to pick the patients who we think really uh, are gonna need that kind of therapy. So I'm gonna change gears and talk about scleroderma-related lung disease. And in this section, we're gonna talk about lung fibrosis or scar tissue in the lung. So if you look at this image here, this is a CAT scan image. These areas here that are mostly uh, black in color uh, are the lungs, and they should look very dark like this uh, because the lungs are mostly filled with air. And what's abnormal here is right down here where there is some scar tissue in the lung. So who has lung scar problems within scleroderma? Well, it really depends on how you define a problem in the lung. Anywhere from 25% to 90% of patients, depending on how you look at the lung, may have involvement in the lung. So if you do a high resolution, very kind of, you know, fine images of the lungs with a CAT scan, actually most patients with scleroderma have a little bit, at least a little bit of lung fibrosis. But again, back to this rule of 15, only about 15% of those patients are gonna have progression of their lung fibrosis. And in those patients, progression of lung fibrosis is gonna to lead to shortness of breath and limitations in activity, and even some more extreme cases for need for oxygen use or for lung transplantation if the disease progresses uh, enough. So how do we look for lung disease in patients? So really what we need to do, and as early as we recognize somebody is having scleroderma, is get an assessment of their lung. And most of the time, that's with a pulmonary function test, which hopefully you're all very familiar with, and a CAT scan of the lung. One, the pulmonary function test tells us about how much restriction their lungs may have because of scarring. And the CT scan gives us a visual of, you know, how much scarring is there or not. And for patients who we think are at risk, and we'll talk about who that is, we repeat these tests, particularly the pulmonary function test, more frequently, like every four to six months if we think somebody is high risk for progression. Lower risk patients, we repeat the pulmonary function test yearly or if they develop new symptoms. And we'll repeat CT scanning if we need to because of a change in the pulmonary function test or symptoms to see if there seems to be progression of the fibrosis visually on the CAT scan. So who do we think is in the risk group for this? So we know that patients on average, if they have the diffuse form of skin disease, seem to have more trouble with lung fibrosis. And we had mentioned earlier that patients who make this SCL70 or topoisomerase 1 antibody seem as a group to be at higher risk for developing lung disease and progression of lung disease. And we think of um, much of the lung fibrosis developing fairly early on in the disease course. So if we see somebody who's already had five or six years of symptoms of scleroderma and they have no fibrosis on their lung scan, we are not likely to see this as a problem. It's almost always there from the, from the time we recognize the disease in people who are gonna have a problem with their lung function. Uh, 
We think racial and ethnic background may play a role where we think African-American patients with scleroderma may have a higher risk for developing both lung fibrosis at all or progression. And what your baseline lung function and what your baseline CT scan look like, we think tells us a lot about what somebody's risk might be. Now, we also know that if you have a totally normal CT scan at baseline, the vast majority of those patients are gonna to continue to have a normal CT scan if we looked again five years later. And if you make antibodies to centromere or RNA polymerase three, your risk of progression is actually lower than other uh, skin groups. So usually we think of these antibodies as being risk factors for having something happen. This is the case where the antibodies tell us this may actually be less likely to happen. But, you know, these features only help us so much. So this is a marker on the left-hand side of lung function called FBC. So this is one of the parameters on the pulmonary function test. And this is the group of patients who have diffuse skin disease. And this is a group of patients who have limited skin disease. And along the bottom here, this is time. So this is what somebody's lung function over time is. And these numbers should be high. Uh, but as you can see in people who have this diffuse disease at the group level, this is kind of an average of this whole group, there's a little bit of loss of lung function over you know, 10 to 15 years with patients who have limited skin involvement have on average relatively preserved um, lung function over time. But this is a good illustration how we can say, okay, what kind of skin disease you have at the group level makes a difference. The people with diffuse scleroderma have some drop in their lung function over time. People with limited scleroderma as a group have kind of stability of their lung function over time. But if you look at each of these individual lines, you know, it would be really hard to uh, separate out uh, somebody's risk based on these lines because there's such a lot of variability. So while these things do help us understand, it's not perfect. And none of these things are a perfect predictor of what's going to happen over time. Same is true for this SCL70 or topoisomerase 1 antibody. As a group, people who don't make this antibody have relatively stable lung function. And as a group, people who do make this antibody have some decline in lung function over time. But as you can see, uh, they call this a spaghetti plot, uh, and you can see why. Um, each person's kind of individual course is highly variable, even amongst a patient, a group of patients who make the same antibody. Uh, and this data came out of what's called the scleroderma lung study that looked at patients who um, responded to the drug in this trial, which is called cyclophosphamide. This was from scleroderma lung study one, which is actually quite a number of years ago now, uh, and suggested actually that the people who were responsive to therapy, so they compared the people who got the drug to people who didn't get the drug, and those who responded to the drug and didn't seem to respond to the drug, were actually people who had more significant fibrosis. And this is one of a number of studies that suggested that people who already had a significant amount of lung fibrosis are going to continue to be at risk for having continued loss of lung function, uh, which is actually a little um, different than what we'd expected uh, before starting that study. So in some sense, it makes sense, right, that people who have already developed a fair amount of lung fibrosis may continue to have more lung fibrosis. But that also tells you that people who have pretty mild amounts of lung fibrosis may not be at so much risk. Um, and so this is a, a way that we talk about scoring somebody's risk uh, based on CAT scan findings about how much fibrosis we see and review of their pulmonary function. And if you look, the group who either has a lot of fibrosis on their CT scan or has already lost some lung function, uh, were bucketed into this more extensive disease group. And this group certainly um, seemed to have more evidence of progression than those who didn't have those features. All right, so let's go back and talk about our patient again in terms of the lung. So this patient has early diffuse scleroderma, which could be things that tell us maybe their risk is actually a little bit higher, but they made RNA polymerase three, which I told you was a negative risk factor, and they had normal lung function tests at baseline and really only minimal changes on their CT scan. So actually, if you take that in total, to me, I think this person is probably at low risk for having progression in terms of their lung. Uh, 
But because they're still early and diffuse, we would monitor them and screen them regularly with their PFT to watch for any change that occurs over time. So to talk about the lung and conclude here, most patients with scleroderma have some degree of lung fibrosis, but the majority of patients who have it will not progress. And the presence of fibrosis finding on CT alone without evidence of progression may not need intervention. So we may not need some of the therapies that we talk about for using uh, in patients with lung fibrosis. All patients should undergo regular screening and patients who have risk factors like their SCL70 positive or their baseline breathing test is abnormal, should really undergo more frequent surveillance. And the amount of fibrosis that somebody has seems to predict future decline and possibly also influence how responsive that person is going to be to treatment. Now, here's the really good news, is that there are now two FDA-approved drugs to treat scleroderma-related lung disease, you know, which I think the last time I gave this talk, uh, there were not. Um, so as we get drugs um, that are going to modify the course of, of lung disease, um, you know, really understanding who's going to be at risk for progression is going to become even more important. So let's change gears again to talk about the kidney. Uh, and this funky little picture down here is the uh, is a image from a pathology specimen of a blood vessel in the kidney. And this is a, a blood vessel problem that causes this uh, complication of scleroderma called scleroderma renal crisis. Uh, so what is this? So this is spasm or narrowing of blood vessels in the kidney, and it leads to two problems, severe high blood pressure and rapid loss of kidney function. And this is something that can lead to dialysis if untreated uh, very quickly. We do not have a good screening test for this, but there is good treatment. So if we recognize this very quickly and we use the right kind of blood pressure medicines, um, we can minimize any uh, negative effect to the kidney. So before we had those drugs, uh, this was something that was universally fatal in patients with scleroderma. So if, before we had any therapy for this, uh, this would damage the kidney to the point where their kidney uh, function was severe, and this also put actually a significant strain on the heart, um, so this was a severe problem. Now, we have therapies for this, uh, but uh, this still is a significant problem, with actually a fair number of patients who have this problem still requiring dialysis, uh, which means that they're they totally lost kidney function. Um, so, what? how do we decide, uh, one, who's going to have this, and two, uh, what happens if somebody develops this. So we know that uh, patients do worse, meaning more often land on dialysis, if we don't recognize this early and we don't control their blood pressure very quickly. So this is a case where we really need to figure out who's at risk so we can very carefully watch for this. Since we can't really predict it very well, we have to recognize it early. And that means that people who we think are at high risk, we need to watch for this very carefully. So how do we do this? So here are the risk factors for developing scleroderma kidney disease. Patients who have diffuse skin disease, like we talked about before, and particularly those who've had a rapid change in their skin disease over a short period of time, seem to be at higher risk for this. Patients who have orally disease, African-American patients with scleroderma, and probably most importantly, those patients who make RNA polymerase three antibodies. So we talked about this antibody before. This tends to associate with diffuse skin disease. But patients who make this antibody, about 25 to 30% of them will have scleroderma kidney problems uh, emerge. And if you look at scleroderma patients as a whole, it's only about three to 5% have this kidney problem. So this significantly changes somebody's risk for uh, having scleroderma kidney disease. And patients who take the drug prednisone also are at a high risk. So I don't know how many of you have heard from your doctors that we worry about the use of prednisone in patients who have scleroderma, particularly who have early uh, scleroderma with diffuse skin disease, but this does seem to increase the risk as well. And we try to avoid it if we can. Interestingly, pre-existing high blood pressure, other antibodies, what your urine test looks like or anything at baseline, don't seem to predict this at all. So let's go back to our patient. Uh, 
our patient has rapid progression of skin disease that's early and makes this antibody. So this is exactly the person who we need to counsel very carefully about the risk for scleroderma kidney disease and try to avoid prednisone if we can. So we educate the patient about this problem and we put them on a regimen to monitor their blood pressure very closely at home and we develop a plan. Okay, if you get a high blood pressure reading, we need to do this. Um, because again, if we pick this up very early, when somebody's blood pressure first becomes high, we can usually mitigate any significant damage to the kidney. So again, majority of patients will never have sclerodermic kidney disease, 95%. But if you happen to be in this high-risk group, the risk is definitely elevated. All patients who have these risk factors should be screening with home blood pressure monitoring, and people who are in these very high risk groups should be monitoring their blood pressure at home very closely because screening is basically the best mechanism we have for pre preventing kidney damage in scleroderma. If we pick this up early, people do better. And there's no data actually, interestingly, that pre-treating somebody with the medicines we use to treat this complication improves the outcomes, in fact, suggests maybe worsens things. So education of the patients and physicians who are taking care of scleroderma patients about this complication and risk factors is really important. This very rarely happens in, in later disease. Um, so this almost always is a problem, you know, very early in the disease. Okay, the last kind of major complication I'm gonna talk about is pulmonary hypertension, and then we'll spend a couple of minutes talking about uh, digital ulcers and GI disease. So just like everything else I've told you about scleroderma so far, pulmonary hypertension in scleroderma is complicated. So this is the schematic of the connection of the heart and the lungs uh, connecting in these blood vessels that are here in the middle. And this is showing kind of the right side of the heart and the left side of the heart, obviously the right side of the heart, left side of the heart are connected normally, uh, but this is just a schematic telling us kind of where some of the problems are in these blood vessels in scleroderma. And most of the time we're talking about this problem, which is called pulmonary arterial hypertension, uh, which is a narrowing of the blood vessels that connect the right side of the heart and the lungs. There are other things that impact this, but uh, we're mostly gonna talk about uh, this left side of the screen here, pulmonary arterial hypertension. Now, unlike everything else I've told you so far, pulmonary hypertension almost always tends to be a later complication of scleroderma and people start to develop this the longer that they've had scleroderma. And on average, we're talking about seven, 10 years into the disease when people start to develop pulmonary hypertension. Some patients develop it earlier, some patients much later. Uh, but importantly, we think this is a condition where there might be this kind of preclinical disease. So before somebody has kind of symptomatic pulmonary hypertension, uh, we may see signs of this. Uh, earlier than that. So this is a study, or actually two studies that looked at survival in people who have pulmonary hypertension with limited skin involvement, uh, suggesting that patients who developed pulmonary hypertension uh, actually uh, did worse. This data comes from mostly from the time before we had effective therapies for pulmonary hypertension, which we'll touch on briefly. What this slide shows, however, is that early detection of some of these early subtle, more subtle signs of pulmonary hypertension by putting people on a fixed program to watch for signs of this makes a difference. So this is how somebody does in terms of survival in a group of patients where they very systematically look for this by doing regular pulmonary function tests and echocardiograms. And those patients who were assessed just uh, by when they started to develop symptoms. So this study very clearly shows that if we look for this systematically in everybody, we probably will pick up disease earlier. And this will have an impact on how patients do over time. So how do we look for this? So all patients with scleroderma get baseline lung function. We already talked about that. And a baseline echocardiogram. This is the ultrasound test of the heart. And the DLCO part of the Brook breathing test is the measure of how well oxygen exchanges. And this test seems to drop as patients are developing pulmonary hypertension and probably drops well before they develop symptoms. So this is another important reason uh, when your doctor says you have to do a PFT every year that you have to do a PFT every year because if we can pick up these early signs of this dropping DLCO, 
and we make a diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension earlier, patients definitely do better. So uh, whether you need an annual echocardiogram or not is a little bit debatable. If somebody has a totally normal breathing test, we may at times be able to defer this, but for the most part, we do breathing tests and echocardiogram every year. And there's also a blood test called a probe BNP level, which measures stretch or strain on the heart. And this is another test that may tell us whether somebody could be developing pulmonary hypertension. Um, so what about risk factors? So we've talked about this with the other complications. Uh, if somebody develops scleroderma at a later age, so not they've had scleroderma longer, but also if they develop scleroderma in their 60s or 70s compared to developing scleroderma in their 40s, this may be a risk factor. People who have other severe blood vessel problems may be at risk for this. Again, this is a blood vessel problem. People who have this DLCO test on the breathing test, this may be an early sign of that pulmonary hypertension may be emerging. And this measure of stretch or strain on the heart could tell us. Uh, the antibody associations of pulmonary hypertension are a little less uh, tight than some of the other ones we've talked about so far, and we don't always measure all these antibodies in clinical practice. So the antibodies are little bit less helpful here. Uh, this is uh, a study that we did on Hopkins that suggested that people who have this blood vessel problem as part of their scleroderma or a more significant problem with these what's called phalangiectasias, these little dilated blood vessels, seem to have higher rates of pulmonary hypertension. And the same is true for people who have a lot of Raynaud's and ulcers. We think as a group, um, blood vessels being damaged in one part of the body may be associated with blood vessel problems in another part of the body, like this pulmonary hypertension. So let's go back to our patient. Our patient has um, early disease, did not have these telangiectasias, um, had normal initial tests, including that DLCO part of the pulmonary function test, and had a normal echocardiogram. So do we need to treat them for pulmonary hypertension? Absolutely not. Do we need to do the more definitive tests for pulmonary hypertension, which is called a right heart catheterization? Nope. We just need to continue to monitor this patient closely, definitely with PFT, probably with echo and these pro BNP levels. This is an area probably pretty, um, we should target for biomarker development because we do think there are these kind of earlier signs that pulmonary hypertension may be emerging. So again, majority of patients will not develop pulmonary hypertension. And for most patients, if this is a problem, it occurs later in the disease. So we can't get um, complacent with this. So even though we talk about the importance of checking PFTs early in scleroderma, this is something that makes us continue to have to do PFTs to watch for early signs of this problem. And studies that suggest that early intervention makes a difference, and this is another area which has really great news that there are 11 drugs available to treat pulmonary hypertension. All the more important to pick this up early uh, if we find it. So I'm going to talk very briefly about um, finger ulcers and GI disease. So finger ulcers is a pretty common problem. These are different pictures of finger ulcers occurring in different places. Uh, but what they share in common is that these are all related to uh, the Raynaud's phenomenon that people have and a decrease in blood flow. Um, and this causes damage to the skin, uh, as you can see in these pictures, and these are incredibly painful. Um, so those of you who have had finger ulcers know very well that this is a um, really uh, significant problem uh, in scleroderma. So what are the risk factors for ulcers? So risk factors for ulcers at all is at the bottom here. More patients who make the centromere antibody and the SCL70 or topoisomerase antibody have ulcers, but not that antibody RNA polymerase three. Uh, it's not really so clear uh, how much of a role smoking plays in the development of ulcers. But the biggest risk factor for having ulcers is having had ulcers before. Unfortunately, people who develop finger ulcers from their ring nodes tend to get them over and over again. So if you've had a prior history of ulcers, that's the single greatest risk factor uh, for having ulcers again, which means that's a subset of patients where we need to be more aggressive in our therapy. Those who seem to be at risk for severe complications of 
gray nodes and ulcers, like developing an amputation, which is the most you know extreme problem related to this ulcers, uh, seems to be more common amongst patients who have centromere antibody. Again, if they've had multiple prior ulcerations, if they have evidence of larger blood vessel problems, um, like the blood vessels that feed blood flow into the hand, for example, uh, they're more likely to have some of these more significant events happen. And people who are older, who have longer disease duration and have other blood vessel problems are probably more likely to develop this complication of finger ulcers. Uh, another way we can look at this is uh, looking at what's called na nail fold capillaries. So some of you may have had this done. This is when a physician takes uh, a magnifier and a light uh, in various forms and looks at the blood vessels that are right around the cuticle in the finger. So um, these are one, blood vessels that can be affected by the scleroderma, but two, kind of give us a little window into white, what might be happening in the blood vessels at large uh, in scleroderma. And these are different pictures here of what these capillaries look like. So these are the smallest blood vessels that we have. And the picture here on the top left is what blood vessels should look like uh, when we do this. There are these little, like we call them little hairpin blood vessels that are kind of all neatly lined up in a little row. And then patients with scleroderma can have a few different abnormalities um, in their blood vessels. So early on, they tend to develop these we call them bushy capillaries or dilated capillaries. So instead of being these nice little squiggles here, this is kind of a bigger, fatter squiggle. And the rest of these actually look fairly normal. Some of them are a little bit enlarged. Um, this can progress. And so you have some bigger blood vessels here, but also some areas where there doesn't seem to be blood vessels. And this can get worse over time, where there's kind of more areas that look like there aren't blood vessels, where there really you know, should be blood vessels. So we can look at these patterns and correlate this with risk for digital ulcers or even other blood vessel complications like pulmonary hypertension. So about 50% of patients with scleroderma will develop ulcers over the course of their disease. The biggest risk factor for having an ulcer is having had an ulcer before. The other risk factors are quite as strong for this. Uh, so monitoring includes looking for signs of more severe disease by looking at these nail capillaries, looking at for evidence of damage to the skin for this. And treatment may modify the risk of development of new ulcers. So there's a drug that was studied called Bosantin, which was actually approved in Europe, but not in the United States uh, for digital ulcers. Uh, that those studies suggested people on that drug had fewer numbers of new ulcers. Uh, but this is certainly an area where we need some more drug development. And then I'm gonna talk very quickly about uh, severe GI disease. So uh, this may take multiple forms. So reflux and its complications, motility problems where the small or large intestine isn't moving very well, and this could lead to bacteria overgrowth problems or what we call pseudo obstruction where things aren't moving, or even to the point of malnutrition where somebody might need a feeding tube or IV nutrition. And it's a bleeding complication called watermelon stomach, which may occur uh, in some patients with scleroderma. The treatment for these we have therapies to address all of these, but it's often empiric, meaning you know, we see somebody who has symptoms where we think it's compatible and we give them treatment because we don't have diagnostic testing that helps us very much, although it does help in certain situations. Uh, so there's really not much here in terms of what we think somebody's risk is for developing severe GI disease, other than the antibodies uh, help us a little bit in this area. Particularly, there's an antibody called anti-fibrillin or anti-U3-RNB. Again, not so important that you remember the names. Uh, but people who have this complication more often have severe GI disease, whereas uh, most of the other antibody groups, the presence of severe GI disease is in a relatively uh, lower number of patients. Um, but we definitely have more work to do in terms of um, understanding risk factors for these more severe GI complications. So to conclude, all scleroderma is not the same. Hopefully this talk gave you a sense that, uh, you know, everybody's scleroderma uh, trajectory or what's going to happen over time is a little bit different from person to person. 
you know, it's somewhat helpful to think about these 15% rules of major scleroderma complications. And for the most part, that rule holds mostly true. Um, these large data sets have provided us really good information about how to identify and understand subgroups of patients that may be higher risk for these complications. But this should really empower physicians and their patients actually uh, to really uh, understand kind of who to look for in terms of uh, who might develop these complications. Understanding the biology of the scleroderma will lead to better biomarker discovery and provide better data about projections and what might happen over time. And as our treatment continues to get better, determining very early who's going to be at high risk for progression will become more and more important. And you know, this is actually happening really now in clinical trials where we incorporate some of this phenotype information into the design and the analysis of the study. So we can actually really understand going forward, you know, which patients really should get directed specific kinds of therapies, or really importantly, if we have a drug that we think works, you know, does this work better in a certain kind of patient or a different kind of patient? So all of that work is being done. And the good news is, is that there are trials going on for different therapies in scleroderma, and they are incorporating some of this data. So I'm going to end there. Uh, hopefully, we've been able to address some of your questions in the uh, chat function. Um, and uh, we will be able to take some live questions uh, now. Hopefully, we've had a little bit of time for that. Uh, but it was a pleasure to speak with you today and uh, happy to take your questions. Thanks so much.